Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Michel Good morning, Han, everyone. My name is Michael Han, and I am a professor of sociology and economics at UNB. Je ne peux pas and parler I'm sorry, I don't speak French that well, and so I have to continue on in English. Sorry. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. I took this as a real opportunity, partly because uh, it's not every day as a demographer that people actually willingly come into a room to hear about internal migration and my immigration. So I'm seeing this, uh, I'm seeing you as a captive audience, and no offense to, at all. The story I'm going to tell you today is about what we refer to as, or what I refer to as, have and have not provinces. So it's, it's very commonplace to talk about equalization payments and you know, economic have and have not provinces. But in terms of demography and demographic have and have not provinces, I think there's something new here. So we'll start with um, a long-term view of Canada's population. And for those of you that like to get your geek on, the census, which is where all of these results come from, it's a real playground. Because what we have is uninterrupted decennial counts by province, you know, before these were provinces, of the number of people living in each region. So you don't have to, you, you probably can't see some of the text in the back, and I ex excuse myself for that, but all you need to really notice from this graph is that there are some lines that are going up quite quickly. That orange one along the top is Ontario, just below it is Quebec, then we have British Columbia and Alberta. Other than that, all of the other provinces have more or less bounced along the bottom along that x-axis throughout time. So what I've become interested in learning more about is trying to identify what's been happening over time. So what is it about Ontario, for example, that in 1901 or so, people really started moving in, really picked up in the 1950s. And I'm just trying, I've been trying to focus on what it is about Ontario or some of the other half provinces that makes this an interesting story to tell and an important story to tell. So you'll be happy to know that I'm not going to talk to you today about how to make babies. So we'll leave that first one there. And if we talk about the three sources of population growth, we essentially have fertility, immigration, and internal migration. Uh, some of the speakers in other towns and cities have already talked about immigration, so I'll leave that one to the side now. And I'm going to focus on that last point, internal migration. How much, in, how much does internal migration, or how responsible is internal migration for those, those differences, that bifurcation that I showed you earlier, dividing Canada into have and have not provinces? So what I did was I looked at 2001 census data, and 2001 is the most recent year for which we can get accurate data about province of birth, and I looked at the proportion of the population that lives in the province in which they were born. So for Newfoundland Labrador, that number, 70.1%, says that 70%, only 70% of all people born in Newfoundland currently live in Newfoundland as of 2001. That number in brackets behind is the proportion of people born in Newfoundland that live in Ontario. So, and, I, and I'm not trying to pick, I, I pick Ontario because it's the top of the graph and it's also where I happen to be born. So I, I, feel, I, I feel justified in picking on it a little bit. So look at some of these, 69.9%, 74%, 73.5%. This is, in a single snapshot of time, how many people currently live in their province of birth. Now, that is a bit of a misrepresentation because in 2001, a lot of people, the baby boomers, had left their province of birth and returned. So if you look at people that leave as they're teenagers and growing into early adults, that is roughly half. So nearly half of all people born in New Brunswick, for example, leave the province for a while, bringing with them their innovative capacity, their entrepreneurial skills, their human, social, physical, cultural capital. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that for now, but I think these numbers are absolutely staggering, just to see how much turnover there is. And if you drill down below the province level, you can see that this isn't just people from all over New Brunswick moving, it's a lot of smaller communities that are losing their young people. So you're probably thinking, uh, I did when I first started looking at these numbers, well, people are just chasing economic opportunity. They just go to another city because th there's more for them to do. And that may be true, but I'd like to complexify that story a little bit for you, if, you, if I may. 
In 1981, and I'll, and I'll look at New Brunswick because that's where we are. In 1981, people that had left, and this was largely baby boomers or those born between 1946 and 1964, when they left New Brunswick in 1981, they were more likely to be unemployed in their new destination. They were less likely to be high earners, which I define as earning over $100,000 a year. They were less likely to be self-employed, so they weren't, really, no, they weren't initially entrepreneurial. So in other words, they did not walk into a land of milk and honey. What they ended up doing, I mean, at least that's, this is my interpretation, is they created their own destinies. Because by 2001, all of these outcomes had reversed. They were twice as likely to own a business, three times more likely to have a university degree, four times more likely to be high earners. So they leapfrogged people in their communities that they joined. And they also leapfrogged the New Brunswickers that chose to stay. So my, my interpretation of these figures is that these are a lot of our best and brightest that are on the move. These are people that are creating their own opportunities, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, etc. And they're going to places like Ontario, to pick on Ontario again, to create opportunity there, leaving the communities that have invested in them so behind. I'm telling you this. Uh, a, because I had to say something, and B, because, because I'm trying to point out that in the next few years, what we're likely to see is another massive wave of out-migration in, in the have-not provinces. So here, and this comes from Statistics Canada, is an age-specific probability of moving. Don't focus too much on the details, just look at that hump at the top there. And what that says is that people typically move when they're around the age of 28. That's when you're really, you're looking for a place to live, you want to settle down, you want to find that white picket fence house, you want a dog, you want 2.1 children, you're going to start looking around for places where you're going to get that. I'm showing you this because if you look at the population of Canada, what these figures suggest is that we're about to hit that. And that by 2017, we're going to be in the midst of our second largest migratory wave in recent history. The first one happened in the 1960s and 1960s to the 1980s. It was the baby boomers. It's that large hump right in the middle. That's about age 55 on average now. The second is currently around age 2022. So by the time we get to 2017, what we're going to be facing is a massive, uh, what we, uh, the potential, the prospect for massive out-migration, thereby further bifurcating Canada into demographic have and have-not provinces. So I'm here today to appeal to you to join me in having a discussion with young people, people in rural, remote, urban, doesn't matter where the communities are, people in communities, talking to them about the decision-making process. How are they choosing where they want to live? When are they making this choice? Is there anything that can be done to convince them to give their home province another chance? And if there is, how quickly can we implement it? How, how can we help? I, I periodically go into high schools across New Brunswick and I ask students, how many of you plan to be in New Brunswick in five years? And I say five years because, you know, allowing for the fact that somebody might go off to get a university degree and then ideally come back, it's not at all uncommon to see less than one in four people raise their hand. So that suggests to me, already then, the seeds of out-migration have been planted. So we need to know a lot more about this process if we're ever going to address it first head on. So my appeal, Canada in 2017, will it be, continue to be composed of have and have not provinces, or will we be able to say that this has been an important milestone whereby we have started to understand the processes that affect where people choose to live. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Michael. It was very, very interesting. So how do you, how do you propose this kind of engagement? Like, What would be even a stepping stone to getting in there, making contact with all these young people, and getting them to realize that where they are is a good place to grow and learn and cultivate and go to school, et cetera. So how do you even begin it's to start that? Excellent question. Uh, 
The short answer is I don't have the answer, <laughs> of course. Uh, but I think, I think what's important is that we can do things like harness the power of technology and remind young people, for example, that even if they choose to move to a large urban center or they choose to move to another province or wherever they end up going, that what they'll often end up doing is replicating the behavior that yep. they could have potentially done in their hometown. So they'll be on Facebook, they'll be on Twitter, they can do all of these things, they'll be on Skype, and they can do all of these things regardless of where they live. So the idea idea of heading to a large urban center because it gives it provides greater access to amenities only makes sense to some extent if um, we if people really actually use all of these amenities yeah thank you thank, thank you, you very, very much, much. Merci beaucoup. it's excellent